So good afternoon, uh, everybody, and you're very welcome to a virtual University College Dublin. My name is Dr. Shane Bergen. I'm a physicist I'm based in the School of Education. I'm a colleague of Maria Bagramian, and I'm involved in the Peritia project, which, as many of you know, pertains to policy, expertise and trust. Um, today, we have Professor Stephen Lewandowski from the University of Bristol, and he will be presenting to us uh, for, um, for a good period of time, and there will be lots of opportunity for you to ask questions of him at the end. Um, this is part of our continued Peritia lecture series. It's the second, second uh, chunk of lectures. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, the contribution of Maya Goldenberg uh, a number of weeks ago, and thank you to many of you for the lovely comments that you sent us about Maya's talk. Um, and how timely it was around vaccine hesitation. Today's talk is equally well-timed. Um, and uh, I, first of all, before I tell you a little bit more about our speaker, would like to um, just remind you about the purpose of the Peritia Lecture Series. We are investigating uh, policy, trust and expertise, and it is sponsored by University College Dublin's Centre for Ethics and Public Life and the American University of Armenia. Many of you will be joining us uh, today um, uh, through the Armenian Translated Channel, and you are very, very welcome uh, to, to our lecture this afternoon. So as I said, our speaker today is a cognitive scientist. He is Professor uh, Stephen Lewandowski from the University of Bristol. And uh, I'm very uh, glad to say that uh, Stephen is a member of the advisory panel for Peritia. Um, and his research examines people's memory, decision-making and knowledge structures, and with a particular emphasis on how people update their memories if information they believe uh, turns out to be false. So um, this has led him to examine the persistence of misinformation and the spread of so-called fake news in society, including conspiracy theories. He's particularly interested in the variables that determine whether or not people accept scientific evidence, for example, surrounding vaccines or climate change. Um, I uh, also congratulate Professor Lewandowski on recently being awarded uh, an advanced ERC grant um, in an area that's uh, very close to today's lecture. Perhaps he might tell us a little bit more during his talk as to the things he's going to investigate. Um, so before I hand over to Professor Lewandowski, I would just like to draw your attention to the questions and answers button at the bottom of your screen. As with all of our lectures, we are very, very keen for you to ask questions of our speaker, and I'll do my best to put them to him at the end. As always, I appreciate brevity in those questions. Um, I haven't yet mastered the skill of being able to read a question, try and uh, <laughs> make sense of it whilst listening to the speaker's answer to the previous question. So your brevity will greatly help me uh, to, to put the questions to Stephen today. So we, we do have plenty of time at the end of this lecture for, for the, that questions and answers. Uh, so, so, so do use the questions uh, button at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Lewandowski for his, pre his presentation this afternoon. Thank you so much, Stephen, over to you. Okay, thank you, Shane, for the kind introduction. Um, my understanding is that you can hear me and you can see my screen. So I will now go ahead and talk about um, technology and democracy and how our cognitive psychology, the way humans think, creates pressure points between democracy on the one hand and online technology on the other. Now, my departure point for this lecture today is the concern that many people have expressed over democracy being in retreat globally uh, during the last decade, at least. This is uh, a map from a report by VDIM analyzing trends in democracy around the world. And you can see that there's quite a bit of orange and red there, meaning a decline and relatively few places in which democracy is increasing. And if you look at the long-term trend for the last 15 years or so uh, from a different source, this is an analysis by Freedom House, they come to the same conclusion. Um, the number of countries that are not free 
is increasing, the number of countries considered to be free is decreasing around the world. And if you then sort of hone in on this and break it down by what the countries are, where democracy is under threat, then the concerning pattern is that this includes countries like the US, Czech Republic, several member states uh, of the European Union, um, countries that are close to us conceptually as well as geographically. Um, what this graph is showing is the trend uh, between 2009 and 2019. And so any point below that diagonal means that country has lost um, aspects of a liberal democracy during the last 10 years. So something is happening out there in not everywhere, but in many places in the world uh, that is of grave concern. Now, Armenia, uh, by the way, is, is doing quite well, according to this analysis. Um, but other European countries have a problem. Now, that democratic retreat is very often blamed on social media, or at least even if it's not blamed on social media, people are very quick to talk about social media as being a problem. Now, in a sense, that's not surprising because social media is huge. This is just one statistic um, about Facebook, one of the largest platforms, and the number of people who are using Facebook is equivalent to, you know, almost twice, almost two Chinas seven uh, United States. Sorry, there's a helicopter that just flew past. That explains the noise. Uh, or 10 Brazils. Now, um, I would argue that it is very difficult to answer this question about whether or not social media or online media generally is to blame for this democratic backsliding because, you know, <laughs> What is it exactly they'd be blamed for? How exactly would this happen? And how would we even know? You know, it's very difficult to come to a clear answer on that. So I don't even want to attempt that because I think it's an, you know, unsophisticated question that doesn't have an answer. However, there are undoubtedly pressure points between online media and democracy that arise from the way human beings think. And that is something that uh, my team and I have recently examined in, a, in an extensive report for the European Commission. Uh, the link is also on the background behind me. And what we've identified in that report and another related paper uh, with Anastasia Kozireva, as first author, what we've discovered there is that we can identify four key pressure points between cognition and technology that are challenging to uh, democracy. And that's the attention economy, choice architectures, algorithmic content curation, and of course, misinformation and disinformation. Now, today I want to focus mainly on algorithms and misinformation, although I'm also briefly going to talk about the other two pressure points. And time permitting in the Q&A, please ask me to expand on that. Now, what do we mean by an attention economy? Well, an attention economy is just that. It means that human attention is the main product online, especially on social media. Your attention when you're using social media is a commodity. It is something that is being sold on. As a rule of thumb, if you're using something for free online, you're the product. It's not free. You're selling your attention to advertisers online. Now, the incentive that emerges from that is intense because the social media platform will make more money because they can sell more ads. Um, the longer users dwell on a platform. Now, um, a prime example of this that I find is, is striking is the autoplay feature on YouTube, which is on by default. And it means that once you've watched a YouTube video, the next one starts automatically and you never chose that. 
The next one is determined by an algorithm and off it goes in the hope that you stick around to watch a few more ads. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, in my opinion, except that we know from decades of research that human attention is captured by emotional context, in particular, negative emotions. And it's captured by novelty. Now, the problem with that is that being novel and being outrage provoking are features of disinformation and misinformation. It's novel because you haven't heard it before because somebody is making it up. And of course they know how to attract attention. So they'll make it up to be outrageous. And so basically we're in the situation where the very nature of online platforms and the attention economy is incentivizing um, poor quality information. And it's important to understand that. Now, the platforms don't do this because they want to undermine democracy. I'm not saying that at all. But by chance and evolution and commercial imperative, we've created an online environment where uh, you can attract attention most easily by creating content that is false and uh, emotion provoking, outrage provoking. And that, of course, is a fertile ground for misinformation and for all these other effects, uh, negative effects on democracy, some of which I'll talk about later on. Now, the second pressure point we identified are choice architectures. Choice architectures refers to the design of online websites and interfaces with platforms um, that are shaped in a way to encourage a certain behavior. So for example, that might involve defaults, such as you know, the default setting is for you to accept lenient privacy settings. Now it's not supposed to be that way under European legislation, but in actual fact, if you analyze it, a lot of platforms do have those lenient defaults and they know how to nudge you into accepting uh, uh, certain things such as face recognition for Facebook, which arguably are more in the platform's interest than in yours, notwithstanding what they might say. And another uh, extreme case of uh, a choice architecture are so-called dark patterns that make it almost impossible for you to exercise a choice. Uh, for example, uh, creating an Amazon account is really easy. Deleting it, not so much. I wonder why. Well, probably because they want you to hang around and spend more money. Now, one of the troubling aspects of all of this is that the settings that platforms are nudging you into can have adverse downstream consequences. And nowhere does this become more apparent than through algorithmic content curation? Now, what are algorithms and what do they do? What do we mean by content curation? Well, it basically means that the algorithm, the artificial intelligence that is now built into an increasing number of platforms, um, will try to maximize user attention. And we have already seen how that is a commercial imperative by satisfying the user's presumed preferences. So they're trying to make you happy in a nutshell. Now that's wonderful, except it might also mean that for some people that happiness or preference satisfaction arises by highlighting increasingly extremist content. Now, we know from research that the ordering of options returned by a search engine or by recommender system, such as Amazon's suggestions for books at the bottom, whenever you buy one, they're suggesting others. That ordering and ranking does influence our behavior and our preferences and perceptions. There's ample research uh, on that uh, being the case. 
And if you then consider the fact that about 70% of viewing time on YouTube results from an algorithm rather than a, a purposeful consumer choice, then you may have a problem because it means that a lot of things being encountered on social media are not chosen on purpose by a user, but are suggested to them by an algorithm. Now, again, let me clarify that algorithms are not inherently bad. In fact, they're completely necessary. Without an algorithm, you would never find anything on the internet. There's too much of it out there. Some algorithm has to sort it and sift it and make it consumable. And the moment you allow for that, you're opening the door to, to great utility for all of us. We use Google every day, all day. Um, but you're also opening the door to less savory consequences. So suppose there's a person known, known as Anne who dislikes violent movies. Well, why shouldn't Netflix recommend other movies to her and withhold the Chainsaw Massacre? Of course, that's great. But what if somebody else likes anything that is supporting his political views, regardless of whether or not they're false? Should that preference also be satisfied? We're, we're entering a zone here that is very problematic and it becomes increasingly problematic when you consider the fact that your personal data on Facebook allow a machine learning algorithm to infer your personality with greater accuracy than your own spouse. Now, here are the data from this study by Yu Yu et al. that was published in 2015. And what this is showing is the accuracy of predicting your personality from Facebook likes through a machine learning algorithm. Now, if the machine has 10 likes, whatever it is you've liked, if you've liked 10 things and the machine has access to that, they can predict your personality better than work colleagues. With 60 to 70 likes, they do better than friends or people you live with. By the time you get to 300, the machine is doing better than your own spouse. In other words, give me 300 Facebook likes and I know more about you than your own spouse does. That is what this research says. And what it implies is that it is possible to micro-target ad advertisements on Facebook to people based on their personalities. Now, that isn't just an idle you know, possibility. Facebook has a patent on that. And they say very explicitly in there, we will use this algorithm to customize advertising, to target ads at a person. Now, the question is, does this work? That's the first question we got to examine. Does this presumed micro-targeting work? Well, in my opinion, it does. There's a study here by Matt's et al. Uh, where they basically put ads on Facebook and they design the ads to appeal to people who are extroverted, outgoing, and introverted, not so outgoing. And they selected the target audience based on the likes that they knew were predictive of that personality pattern. So effectively, they used Facebook to run a quasi-experiment where they targeted 3 million participants with cosmetic ads and then wanted to see whether matching the user's personality to the presumed attributes of the ad, whether that would enhan enhance sales. Here are two examples of those ads that were used in that particular study. Uh, and now that I've told you what the study is about and what it's looking at, you may recognize that, sure, the one on the left appeals to extroverts, presumably, whereas the one on the right appeals to introverts. And the researchers verified that before they ran the experiment through a separate validation process uh, for their ads. And what you find is that matching ads to personality works. In these data, green means introverted, blue means extroverted. 
And what you can see is that if you show extroverted ads to an extroverted audience, you sell more. These data are conversion rates, click-through rates. How likely is it that people will click on an ad and then ultimately maybe buy your product? Well, extroverts buy more extroverted ads. Introverts buy more introverted ads. It's a, it's a beautiful crossover interaction. You match it, you sell more. You mismatch, you sell less. It's as simple as that. Now, some people have critiqued this study, but the authors have rebutted those criticisms. In my opinion, my judgment, this study shows what it purports to show. And indeed, we have lots of other laboratory follow-ups suggesting that matching ads and their characteristics to appeal to certain personalities maximizes their effectiveness. Now, with cosmetic ads, that doesn't concern me terribly much. It becomes much more crucial and critical and potentially problematic when the messages that are being matched to a person's personality are political in nature, because then you can exploit people's vulnerabilities without their knowledge to manipulate them. Here are some of the harms that have been attributed by you know, philosophers and ethicists and political scientists to political micro-targeting, and I agree with all of them. I mean, the first thing that happens is that no one knows it's being done. Most people, most users don't. And it's exploiting their personal data in ways that the user is very unlikely to have given consent to. It also conceals its intent and nature. No one is telling you, hey, I'm a political ad. I'm going to manipulate you. No, of course not. You're just showing a message that was designed specifically for you. And if no one else can see it, how can you rebut it? Where is the free marketplace of ideas on which uh, democracy is based? Where is the opportunity for correction? Well, that goes if you go to micro-targeted political messages. It also allows politicians to make mutually incompatible promises to different segments of the electorate. And this isn't just some theoretical possibility. The FDP, the Free Democratic Party in Germany during the recent election just a few weeks ago, was placing mutually incompatible commitments uh, onto Facebook targeted at different audiences. And they have been found, these ads. And if you look at that, you figure, well, hang on, you either mean this or that, but you can't really do both. You can't promise people not to regulate and promise other people to regulate carbon emissions. Well, either one or the other, but not both. And yet they advertise both. And finally, it allows foreign actors to influence domestic political campaigns. Now, of all these problems, and there's more, to me, the most important one is that it moves politics from the public sphere to secret manipulation. And that is problematic for democracy. And people recognize that because in a recent study that I published, colleagues and I published earlier this year, we show in a very large survey done in the UK, the US and Germany, that the public overwhelmingly is very uncomfortable with political micro-targeting based on personal data, such as personality or sexual orientation or other very personal things. So it's a problem the public doesn't want to have, and yet it is happening. So what can we do? Well, lots of things. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we can do is regulate the social media platforms. But the other thing we can do, which is a little faster and maybe a stopgap solution, is to teach people that they might be micro-targeted. And I want to briefly tell you about a study where we did that. We tried to reverse engineer micro-targeting by boosting people's knowledge about themselves. So the intent of this experiment was to say, oh, okay, if people are being micro-targeted, maybe the least we can do is to give them the tools to recognize when that happens and to then perhaps become more resilient to being manipulated by those ads. So we ran 
a very simple experiment. This may look complicated, but it was actually very simple. We took, you know, hundreds of people and we randomly put them in one condition or the other. And the important condition is the one on the left where we gave people a personality scale to measure their extroversion and introversion. And we gave them feedback on that score. Now, after we did that, they had to classify ads, the ads from the study I already showed you by Matt's and colleagues, into being targeted at them or not. That was the only task. And in the control condition, people had to do exactly the same thing, but we didn't tell them anything about themselves ahead of time that was relevant. We gave them an irrelevant inventory rather than informing them about the introversion or extroversion. So how did this work in the actual experiment? Well, imagine you were in the experiment, you would start out by doing a personality test on introversion, extroversion. You know, you just click a few things, uh, a few items and express agreement or disagreement with certain items. We then analyze your score and we explain to you what it would mean to be an extrovert or introvert. So in reality, of course, we had a lot more text than just this. But just to explain what went on, we would say something like, hey, extroverts tend to be enthusiastic, outgoing, action-oriented individuals. Introverts tend to seem a little quiet, low-key. They like being at home, deliberate, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we explained this personality dimension, which is one of the most understood and best known personality dimensions out there. And then in addition to this generic information, we also told people their own score. So an extrovert might get something like this. It says, hey, you're extroverted. By the way, you're more extroverted than 74 out of 100 people of your age. Only 26 people uh, of your age are more extroverted. So they, they're given a position on this distribution and they walk away thinking, yeah, hey, I'm an extrovert. An introvert might get the complete opposite. You know, something like this is completely arbitrary, just an example. You're more introverted than 98 people of your age. Congratulations, you're probably a mathematician, okay? Uh, that is the feedback that we gave to people and then they had to classify the ads. All they had to do was to say, yes, this one is targeted at me, or no, it's not. And this particular ad, um, well, guess what? If you're an extrovert, is it targeted at you? Yes, probably. If you're an introvert, no. So we give people personality information. We, we're, we're completely transparent in what the experiment is about and why we do it. And we then ask people, hey, is this targeted at you or not? And here are the data. Now on the left, what we have is the control condition. That's the condition where people were not given feedback about their introversion, extroversion score. They were given irrelevant feedback about some other thing relating to technology. Now, in that condition, people are above chance. You know, they do about 60% correct. Chance would be 50, 50%. 50 tossing, tossing a coin would give you 50%. People do better than that. But there is considerable variability in their responses. You know, there's, there's an even number, equal number of people who are perfect at it. But, you know, some people in the equal number of people is below chance. You know, there's, there's a huge spread in this. And, um, you know, people aren't terribly good at it. But now watch what happens in the other condition where we get even personality feedback. A massive effect. Average accuracy is now around 90%. And the modal response, that is the one that occurred most often, was perfect performance on all the ads. Wow, that's a real boost. That is people, that is making people a lot more accurate, giving them a lot more uh, tools to observe when they're being targeted. So what we can conclude about 
micro-targeting and algorithmic curation is that, yes, targeting <laughs> exists and it works. At least we know it works for commercial ads. We also know from our last experiment here that you can teach people to detect that. And maybe that is a first step towards resilience. At least it gives them the choice to say, well, hang on, somebody is trying to manipulate me here. Maybe I, I don't want to be manipulated. Now, what we don't know yet is how this works uh, for political messages and whether having been informed of this, it actually makes people resistant to being manipulated. That we don't know yet. And that brings me to my last uh, pressure point, misinformation and disinformation. Well, everything I said so far is kind of leading up to this. And I've hinted at it already that the attention economy is creating conditions where misinformation and disinformation is particularly attractive. Uh, for the platforms because it enhances advertising revenue and where um, through algorithmic curation, you can, you know, choose things to pump at people that is exploiting their particular vulnerabilities. Now, clearly, misinformation is not a good thing for democracy. I think that goes without saying. If people make decisions based on things they don't understand. Um, then, you know, that can lead to bad decisions. And I'm living in a country that is suffering from a bad decision made five years ago, let me tell you, on a daily basis. Um, now, having said that, if you look at the prevalence of fake news, then at least in the United States, it does not dominate the media landscape. It also does not dominate social media. And the exposure to, to actual fake news coming from directly from the source of fake news is actually limited to a small number of people in the United States. When I say small number, it's still, a, you know, millions, but it's not like a hugely, it's not like nowhere near half the population, far less than that, maybe 10%. However, fake news, despite being limited in its circulation, uh, can still set the political agenda uh, by various means, and it can be amplified by mainstream media. And you know, anybody who remembers the so-called pizza gate affair from four or five years ago, when a person walked into a pizza uh, pizzeria in in Washington and started firing a gun because they they were misinformed about there being a basement full of children uh, kidnapped by Democrats. Well, there was no basement, and of course there were no children. This was a complete invention that emerged on social media. Well, and yet it went mainstream. And of course the insurrection earlier this year is another example of how misinformation, namely the baseless claim that Donald Trump <laughs> didn't lose the election, uh, how that can lead people to engage in violence. So yes, misinformation is clearly democratic to democracy. And we now have evidence, emerging evidence, more and more that this is a causal determinant of people's behavior. Here's a study that was came out last year, very clever study where they used a clever statistical technique known as instrumental variable analysis to identify a causal effect of watching Fox News on people's compliance with social distancing. And it turns out the more people watch Fox News, the less likely they would wear masks and engage in social distancing. And of course, this had public health consequences downstream. So misinformation matters. We also know it from experiments. Here's another example. This was done in the US and the UK, where exposure to misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines reduced intention to get vaccinated by a considerable margin. And another study that used a clever statistical technique to get at causality done in Germany a few years ago, uh, demonstrated that uh, if you could reduce the amount of anti-refugee hateful content on social media, on Facebook in particular, this would decrease the number of attacks, violent attacks 
against refugees. So misinformation matters, and we know that that is the case. We also know who is susceptible to misinformation and disinformation, and the list on the right may not surprise you. Uh, those are the variables that increase susceptibility. This is averaging across a lot of research to make those claims. On the other hand, people or the list of attributes on the left is decreasing susceptibility to being misinformed. People who engage in analytic thinking and who think that they need evidence to make a judgment about truth, or guess what, they're less susceptible to misinformation than people who feel that, you know, intuition is a guide to truth. So we know all that. And um, we also know <laughs> that this then creates this perfect storm where the algorithms are promoting attractive, engaging content um, that appeals to everybody on the right with all these attributes of their personality and their thinking and who, who like, in a sense, to be outraged and to, to, for their intuitions to be fostered and who are willing to then accept things that are, that are clearly wrong. Now, we also know uh, what to do about that. And uh, my colleagues and I have recently published a handbook on this. The link is also in my background. I changed that for those of you who are interested in getting into this in more depth. This was a compendium of, of hints and helpful information for practitioners to deal with uh, misinformation and how to correct it. Now, anybody can download this if you're interested. It's available in 14 languages or something. And I don't have time to go through it all. But what I do have time is to tell you about something called inoculation. And uh, during the q and I'm more than happy to, to pick up more uh, questions. Uh, what's inoculation? Well, inoculation is something that you can do akin to a medical vaccination by anticipating how people might be misinformed and by giving them tools ahead of time. It's very similar to the experiment I told you about where we taught people about their personality and they were then able to identify ads that were targeted at them. Inoculation similarly is first of all warning you that you might be misled and then is giving you the tools uh, by preemptively refuting an anticipated misleading argument. Inoculation teaches you ahead of time what you might expect and how you can spot a bad argument. For example, we've done this in one experiment. We tell people, hey, if it's really emotional and you feel outraged after you read it, wait a minute, maybe somebody is trying to you know, manipulate you. Be careful if you're outraged because it may not be an honest attempt to communicate or incoherence. If somebody is incoherent, if somebody says, hey, you can't measure global temperature accurately, so there is no global warming. And in the next sentence, they tell you, oh, don't worry, it's been cooling for 15 years. Well, wait a minute, that's incoherent. If you don't know what the temperature is, how do you know it's cooling? It can't be both. We can train people to spot that and they become resistant to misinformation. And we can do that without knowing exactly what they're gonna see. We just know how they're gonna be misled. And that we can use to make them more resistant to misinformation without us having to know what exactly they're gonna see. Now, this has been shown to work in many contexts, including some very challenging contexts, such as uh, protecting people against radicalizing material, either Islamophobic or Islamist. It actually works both ways, regardless of polarity, regardless of whether you're an Islamist fundamentalist or a right-wing Islamophobic person, or, or at least material that you're, you're encountering. Uh, we can inoculate people against both using the same brief training video.
Okay, and I was given 35 to 40 minutes, and I think I've had about 37 and a half. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty close in my timing. Um, those are my conclusions. We do have a problem with democratic backsliding. Um, and some of that may well be due to these clear pressure points between how people think and how our attention is structured and how the online technology is designed. And those pressure points have clear adverse implications for democracy. There's a perfect storm out there between our attentional system and the online curation of content that is making it easy for misinformation to affect uh, the political agenda. And with that, I just want to conclude by thanking my funders and in particular, my, my many collaborators, I was, you know, I can't list them all, but here are some of the key people who deserve a lot of the credit for everything I talked about today. So thank you for your attention. And I now look forward to Q&A. Wow, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I've learned so much from your uh, presentation today. It was most enjoyable and uh, fascinating you know I, I, it's so timely um like are, i'm curious to who who in uh positions of power is interested in your work be they public <laughs> or private uh actors well uh it seems judging by the emails i get it seems a lot of people are interested in it um now i do quite a bit of work uh with the european commission um, because, well, I'm, I'm actually heavily involved with them. I was in Brussels for two months earlier this year working with the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission, which is tasked with providing scientific evidence to underpin regulation. Because I think um, a lot of the things I've talked about are solvable through uh, clever regulation without censorship, simply you know, providing people with the tools to resist being misinformed. And, you know, there's, there's a number of things that, that can be done. So I do work with the commission a lot. Um, I also work with Google, not Google itself, but their spin-off think tank called Jigsaw. Uh, they fund some of my inoculation work. Um, so, I, you know, that's a, that's a private corporation. Uh, I'm not working with Facebook. Um, that's a principal decision on my part because I want to retain my independence. Um, and then the list goes on. I mean, there are other, you know, I, uh, I do a lot of work also for the, you know, German branches of the German government who, you know, approach me about vaccinations and about misinformation and foreign policy and the UK cabinet office. I mean, you know, the list goes on, but I, I, I would highlight the two I mentioned, uh, the European Commission being foremost among them. Well, it's great to hear that the European Commission are uh, investing uh, through the European Research Agency in your work as well. So um, we, we, we have uh, questions coming in, you'll be glad to hear, and lots of uh, people saying thank you for your wonderful presentation. The first is from Keen uh, Mintz Wu, who uh, thanks you again for the presentation and says, Recognizing the potential for resilience or recognition of micro-targeting, what do you think are the most important messages uh, or training that could help make young people, uh, who they suggest are 10 to 15 year olds, media literate? Presumably mm -hmm. uh, big um, five ba uh, based training is too sophisticated for such young people, this, this questioner uh, suggests. Yes, that's a very good and important question. Now, um, I don't know of any work that has looked at specifically personality and targeting, you know, protecting people against targeting. However, that, that I don't know, uh, and that may be difficult. However, I do know of work done by Sam Weinberg, for example, at Stanford University that is teaching high school students um, to, to learn how to uh, understand the internet better. One of the key insights of, of his work is, is a skill known as lateral reading. 
which is what fact checkers use. Now, what is lateral reading? What it means is that if you look at a website and you're trying to figure out whether it is credible, um, you don't spend time on that website because any website can, can be made to look authentic and plausible and credible. I mean, you know, the, the, you just hire somebody, give them a couple thousand dollars and they'll, they'll make you a website that looks credible. So don't waste your time on that. Instead, open a lot of other tabs and search reputable sources of, of information, such as, you know, the New York Times, Wikipedia, Google overall, government websites, when it is a, you know, a health-related issue, go to the NHS, go to the CDC, and see what they have to say about that other website. And if you do that, then within five minutes, you'll know whether or not to trust that original website. Um, it is remarkably easy to go elsewhere and find out whether that's a genuine website or a front group for some corporate interest or political, politically motivated operators. Um, and, and high school students can learn that. They love it because it makes them feel really clever once they know how to do it. And that's done with people in their teens. I don't know of anything with 10 year olds. Actually, that's well, there's some work done in, in Britain by Jeff Walton. I think he's looked at kids younger than teenage. Uh, but certainly teenagers, you can train that particular skill very effectively. We know that. Might I suggest that younger people are perhaps more adept and skilled than those over a certain age group? I'm not, not wishing to castigate either of us well, in, in any age bracket, <laughs> uh, but speaking in generalizations, I, I often wonder, are those in positions of power just, just not sophisticated enough in their understanding of technology in the way that many people who are, say, below the age of, of I don't know, 35 or 40 are, are, are so-called digital natives, if such a term makes sense? Well, well I, I, I guess it depends on how, uh, how benign your assumptions are about the people in power. I mean, another way to interpret their behavior is to say that they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, they're just not doing it for the common good. Um, I mean... You know, that's that's an alternative. And um, I wrote a paper last year about Donald Trump's use of Twitter to divert attention from things he didn't like, uh, which suggests to me that, in fact, uh, um, well, I mean, you we can't be sure, but his behavior is certainly fully consistent with the idea that he understands how to use social media and he was playing the mainstream media like a piano. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there is that. I agree that digital natives are very savvy uh, in many, many ways, um, but equally there is concerning evidence about young people just being exposed to, to a flood of misinformation, uh, especially on platforms like TikTok, where, where there is a lot of misinformation against vaccines, for example, circulating. Mm. So it's a slightly mixed bag, but you're absolutely right. Age, as I mentioned, is a risk factor and the, the uh, um, most misinformation in the United States online is shared by people who are over 65 and in particular who are extremely conservative. They're the two risk factors that multiply. But age, yeah, older people seem to have difficulty with that. Um, it's unclear whether that's simply because they learned about social media late in life and are just therefore not, you know, they just haven't caught a one. Uh, it's harder to learn things late in life than if you're a teenager. Or whether it is an age-related decline that even the digital natives will suffer by the time they get there in 30 or 40 years. We don't know that yet. Which would be interesting to see whether that carries across other countries. As I, I suspect one of the big differentiators between people in that those two age categories is the uh, approaches to their education. Uh, younger people now are their educations are far more about, you know, looking at reliability of sources, et cetera, rather than rote yes. learning, which might have pertained in the past. We have a question from Angela Long, uh, who asks, does Professor Lewandowski think that regulation or licensing could, um, could change and improve the situation of misinformation? Perhaps, um, Angela says, within five years, maybe. Well, um, 
Yes, actually, I do think that. I, I do think regulation can make a difference um, without necessarily inducing censorship. There, there are clever things we can do um, or we can ask the platforms to do that would make a difference. Let me, let me give you one example that isn't based on regulation, but where a little change made a big difference. And that relates to WhatsApp in India. There was a series of mob killings in India a few years ago when mobs seemingly spontaneously would congregate and kill innocent people out of, out of nowhere. Why? Well, it turns out that was driven by WhatsApp. And what it was, was that there was a fake video circulating about people who snatch children off motorbikes or something. And there were instances where that fake video was circulated by people in villages in India pointing the finger at this car that was just driving down the street with harmless, innocent people in it who had no, nothing to do with anything. And that was sufficient to cause a mass panic and for a lot of people to congregate. And in you know, 30 or so people got killed. It was very uh, uh, tragic. Now, when that became apparent, eventually WhatsApp did uh, two things. Number one, they identified a forwarded message as being forwarded. Whereas previously it seemed to come from your friend. Now at least, when you got it, you could tell your friend had in turn forward. The other thing they did was to limit the number of channels to which you could forward messages to five. And what that did was to make it much, much harder for this information to go viral and for people to uncritically accept it. And there hasn't been any mob inspired violence since then. Now, uh, we don't know if that's a causal effect. You know, we can't run the experiment, obviously. It's just a, a striking observation how that instantly uh, dealt, seemingly dealt with the problem. And that's just one little example of so-called friction, introducing friction that will make it harder for, for people to share things. Twitter is doing this already now, um, where if you want to share something or retweet something with a link that you haven't looked at, it'll prompt you and say, hey, don't you want to read this first? Now you can override that, but little bits of you know, friction is a very effective means of slowing people down, giving them time to think. And for many people, the threshold, their impatience is so great that they will just cancel out because they can't be bothered to go through the hoops. So there, there are circuit breakers like that that we could design into platforms. Um, and, and the list goes on. You know, all of these things could potentially be regulated. Uh, and, and a lot of that can be done without uh, censorship. For example, you can also just ban political micro-targeting. You know, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. You can just say, don't do it. Um, and Google, in fact, before the last election, my understanding is that they said they turned that off uh, in the lead up to the last American presidential election. So, yeah, there's plenty of stuff that can be done. We just got to have a conversation about it and then uh, make it happen. And that's a political battle that is happening right now. And it'll right, be interesting right. to see how that comes down. I'm smiling as I, I thought, you know, in terms of the frictions, perhaps uh, when we hit the reply all button on our our um, our emails, you know, maybe there's something that should come up on Gmail saying, are you sure you need to send this to, you know, 50 people <laughs> in your school? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 Rosemary Thomas has a, a, a question and maybe it follows nicely from your talk of friction is, what about ourselves taking action? Can we mess up the algorithms by just not being honest, liking things we don't like and searching for random topics, yeah. et cetera? Yeah, very interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, yes, of course, you, you, you can, you know, you can, you can do that and you can then see what effect that has. Um, I'm not on Facebook, so I, I don't, you know, I don't, I therefore don't bother with that. But um, I know other people who do say that they, you know, sometimes like stuff 
that they don't actually like just to, you know, make the algorithm give them different things. But of course, then the, you get very annoying ads for things you really don't want um, as, a, as a consequence. But yes, there are some people who are seriously uh, trying to disrupt algorithms. There, there's instructions online about how to beat algorithms, and you can do that. Now, part of the problem, of course, is that, as I, as I said, you know, algorithms are indispensable and they're a good thing most of the time. I, I like what Amazon suggests to me when I buy a book because <laughs> I want to buy them all. I mean, they're spot on in their recommendations. <laughs> yes, I'm interested in that. Give me more. And, and so they're not a bad thing. Um, you know, if, if a recommender system tells me what movie I'm likely to, to like, well, great. That means I don't waste my time watching something terrible or worse yet paying for it. You know, who wants to do that? So algorithms aren't just a bad thing. We, we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Sure. And I suppose, you know, I was trying to think during your talk about the differences between these forms of media uh, and targeting ads compared to more traditional um, uh, forms. And I suppose that they are all subject to algorithms in their own way, right? But maybe is a difference that one is consciously um, edited or, or controlled by editors and the other is, is more done by the machine, as it were. So it's kind of unseen uh, at a local level. Yeah, the fact that it's machine, that it's a machine doesn't bother me much because uh, not necessarily. I mean, machines can do a very good job. And there's actually a lot of psychological literature out there suggesting that, you know, machines can outperform experts in, in a lot of contexts, including medical diagnosis and that sort of mm. thing. So I'm not averse to a machine telling, giving me a recommendation. What I just don't want is uh, for the machine to infer things about me, like my personality or sexual orientation or whatever, and then use that to manipulate me. That is when, when things become super problematic. Um, and, and that is one of the problems where the data that we hand over to the social media platforms are just allowing them to learn so much about us that they can then use in ways we, we never even imagined. And, and that is, that is where, where I see the problem. The moment that is being exploited by commercial or political interests and, and we have no idea. And do you, like, where do you see this going, I suppose? So like, will, will enough of us realize what's happening and force change through various channels or, you know, it, will there be a tipping point where we could have governments buying data about, as you, you suggested, the sexual orientation of, of some of their citizens, where they may wish to act on that or, or other information that might be of interest to governments for controlling people? Um, like, is that unrealistic, in your opinion? Or do you, do you, do you, do you have a nightmare scenario that you could see down the road, perhaps, um, Oh, uh, look, it's very, it's very easy to be dystopian uh, because mm. the technology does provide a lot of power to do immense harm. Uh, so it's very easy for me to be dystopian. Yes, and, and the thought of a, an authoritarian government getting a hold of all the Facebook data and using it for their purposes is, is nightmarish indeed. Um, whether that's going to happen, well, who knows? You never know anything. A lot of things have happened that I never thought possible, um, you know. And and so so yes, it could happen. What I'm more concerned about, what is what is more realistic, I think, in the, in the short run, is not governments but social media platforms. Uh, continuing to provide the tools with which you can undermine uh, democracy, and and as as I've you know tried to outline, that to me is is the biggest problem. That um, you know disinformers uh, can manipulate people with impunity through political advertising, and that we don't necessarily know what is happening because. 
um, that's a long story in itself because, you know, Facebook, for example, claims that all their political ads, all their ads are visible in the ad library. But then if you have a look and you audit that, it actually turns out not all of them are there, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, it, so, so I think a small nightmare scenario is completely plausible within the current constraints as far as we understand them. And to my mind, the solution there, frankly, is to do what happened in the 1970s with, with Ma Bell in the US. You just break up the monopoly and, and mm. uh, uh, keep a monopoly from being a monopoly. And um, so I think what has to happen is, is that the platforms are broken up as, as nasty as that sounds. I think, you know, we did it with the telephone companies. Uh, to good effect in the 1970s and 80s in the United States. And um, a similar situation in my mind is, is upon us now. And, but whether that'll happen, of course, is it, you know, it's wide open politically. Yeah. Um, like, would, would, that, uh, would there be a challenge with the sort of international uh, nature of these companies? Would there, would there be the need for transnational bodies to intervene? Of perhaps? course. Yeah. Um, of course. And that... Indeed, yes. Uh, I mean, that's one of the one of the big problems, and that is why it's so essential for the EU to do this because that is a mm -hmm. supranational body, um, and one of the few, if 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 the only uh, institution that could take on the platforms, um, and is moving in that direction, you know, very nicely and gently, and there's talking to Facebook about codes of conduct and all that sort of thing. Um, which is fine, provided that the outcome is, is you know, in the, in the public's interest and not in the interest of Facebook. Um, yeah, I think you need supranational legislative initiatives. And um, again, I don't want to bash Facebook just because, you know, I, I, it's not just <laughs> that they're all bad. It's simply that they're huge and they do certain things badly and their corrective efforts are insufficient and there are too many concerning um things emerging from in facebook for me to 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 put too much faith in them yeah um questions coming in from from lots of people i put a few together from lisa foreign and uh, bert rima who basically kind of suggest that they like the idea of the inoculation, but wonder what about those that may be somehow resistant to it? Like they just don't want to hear it, you know, kind of that way sure. inclined already. Yes. Well, of course, there are always people who don't want to hear anything because they have all the answers. Uh, of course. Yes. Um, now, the, the, the good thing is there are two good things. Number one, there aren't that many of those people. They're, they're allowed on social media and seem to be everywhere, but in real life, there aren't that many of them. Uh, the second good news is that, you see, inoculation is not telling people what to do or what to believe. Quite on the contrary, in all our inoculation experiment, we use examples when we train people that are completely non-political and that we create to be, you know, slightly humorous sometimes, kind of, you know, we stick in a few jokes in our videos that, that um, train people. And we do that on purpose because the last thing you want to do is, is to offend anybody so their defenses go up. Hmm. You know, no, that's, we don't want to do that. We, we want to be as, as neutral as possible because once you have the skill, once you know that incoherence is a marker of bad argumentation, well, you can then choose not to apply that to messages you like, but, but you can't blame us for having given you the skill to, to, to detect it. And so that's one of the fascinating aspects of inoculation, that we can actually show that once inoculated, people can apply that to messages of different polarity. Islamophobic versus Islamist. I mean, you can't think of anything. I can't think of much that's more polarized and opposing than that. And yet for both classes of messages, we can inoculate people using a completely neutral context. Um, I, I read last week in, in The Economist that um, 
the bashing last week they described it of of uh, social media giant Facebook by um, both Democrats and Republicans is one of the few areas where there was genuine cross party support. And um, it just struck me that I wondered, you know, I I, I don't doubt for a second the uh, the things you you said about them and others, but like, can there be a certain degree of scapegoating? Um, for example, the links between increased use of social media and effects on mental health. Um, fr from, from my understanding of it, th th that isn't as well established as it's often said to be. Um, and I just wonder, like, uh, have, have you seen much scapegoating going on? Or uh, like, perhaps are, are the arguments that are being made about um, social media and other internet companies sophisticated enough to get to the actual issues? Or sometimes are they maybe just throwing a few things in there with, 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 uh, with them? Yeah, you know, that's a very good point. And that is why I started out saying, hey, everybody blames the social media. Mm. And is that even a meaningful question? And, and I agree, you, you know, I'm very reluctant to, to scapegoat the social media because I'm on social media all day, right? I mean, I'm on mm. Twitter. Uh, I don't use Facebook because it's simply not my thing. Um, but I am on Twitter. I use WhatsApp. Um, you know, I'm also on Instagram, although I never have time uh, <laughs> for all of that. Um, so I'm, yeah, I think we got to be careful that we don't bash social media without, without calls. Um, and and I'm, I, I am concerned about that because if we do that, then it's also an easy out for the social media giants because they can say we're being scapegoated and they can deflect from the real problems because now I think there are some real problems there. Um, and, and we have to pinpoint those and we've got to talk about those. The, the fact that Democrats and Republicans are, are bashing <laughs> Facebook is, is interesting because that is, would be in line with our data that I mentioned during the talk, which shows, actually, I, I'm not sure I did mention that. I did say that in three different countries, people don't like political micro-targeting based on personal information. What I didn't mention but what I should mention now is that that was across the political spectrum in all three countries. There was no political polarization on that. And to me, that's amazing because there are few things that, that Americans are not uh, polarized on. Uh, uh, one of them incidentally is, is Ireland. Uh, you'll, you'll be pleased to hear that. <laughs> Support for the Good Friday Agreement is, is bipartisan. Um, and, and the, the other thing is, seems to be attitudes towards, uh, personalized targeting. People don't like being manipulated regardless of political color. And we have actually observed that in, in a number of experiments that in particular, uh, conservative Republicans get very, uh, irritated when they discover they're being manipulated even if it is sometimes, even if it is messages that they actually are, that, that is consonant with their ideology, they still don't like being manipulated. So that to me is a, is a very good angle to, to convince people on both sides of politics um, that, that there is a problem we have to deal with. So, but, <laughs> You know, the, the road from that to legislation or a solution is very long and anything can happen. And uh, uh, so it remains to be seen. Well, perhaps my last question for you this evening might be to help us a little along that road. If, if you were to have a meeting with uh, our prime minister called the Taoiseach, what, what might you suggest to him? Uh, and I, I assume that cross-party support would uh, pertain to Ireland as well. So knowing he'd have a free ride, um, what would you say to him to make Ireland and perhaps Europe by extension a safer place? Well, I would say precisely that, you know, Ireland uh, uh, is, you know, there, there's little point in Ireland trying to develop legislation to, to rein in Facebook on their own. 
Um, I think it has to be done at the European level. Uh, there's just, you know, by the time you talk about the European Union, you talk about the world's largest market, 400 million people with immense commercial power. And that is where you can make things happen. Uh, so that would be my advice. It, it is, you know, this is something that has to be done by Europe. And, and you know, I love the Republic of Ireland, but I think, you know, take it on Facebook. Eh. Maybe wait a little before you do that. <laughs> well, uh, Facebook, as you may know, have a very large office here in uh, in Dublin. So uh, we yes, they do, and they don't we... pay a lot of tax apparently. So no, no. other issue yeah. to the TSIC that maybe they should tax uh, uh, people properly. So uh, yes, but that's a political that's judgment. Good. That's somewhere. That's not a scientific judgment. And I suspect you and I might might agree on on that. Um, Professor Lewandowski, thank you for your wonderful talk and your generosity in taking so many of the questions from uh, our our listeners and viewers today. Uh, we were joined by many people here on the Zoom call and more on the um, on the associated YouTube channel. Um, as I mentioned at the start, our talk has been recorded today and will be available through the Peritia website and its various social media platforms. Uh, so you can you can find out more there. Um, you can also follow the professor himself on Twitter. Um, the links will be uh, in the, uh, the, the latest Peritia tweet. We'll be back um, in two weeks time for another talk about, um, about climate change this time. So we're, we're going through some of the big issues in, in our lecture series this term. We've had vaccination hesitancy, we've had technology and, um, and its effects on democracy today. And we're moving on to perhaps the issue of our time climate change in two weeks time. We hope that uh, you will uh, be able to join us and uh, we look forward to a very interesting and engaging conversation that day. So um, I will just thank the professor again, Professor Lewandowski for his wonderful talk yeah. again and uh, perhaps ask him to hang on for a moment as my colleague, Professor Bagramian may wish to come on and say her farewells to you. To everyone else, we'll see you in two weeks time. Thank you.